you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. And we're looking at part 2 of the, this two-part passage or two-sermon passage. So Galatians 3, and I'm going to read the entire passage again, verses 15 to 22. Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations, even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. What I'm saying is this, the law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law, it's no longer based on a promise, but God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. Why the law then? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Now, a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Amen. Will you join me in prayer? He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. Amen. Well, in part one, last week, we focused on the first uh, few verses, verses 15 to 18, where Paul there was basically showing us that even though the law in Moses came 430 years after Abraham, after he'd given Abraham the promise, the promise was how we can be right with God, how we could enter into fellowship with God and uh, inherit eternal life. He had given that promise to Abraham, and it came by believing. But now, 430 years later, you have Moses in the law, And the false teachers, the Judaizers, were teaching the Galatians that when that happened, God's plan of salvation changed. That at that point in biblical history, it was no longer about believing, but it was about now keeping the law. So in those first few verses, Paul argues against that. And he tries to prove that's not right. And remember the illustration, the comparison he used there, was that of a last will and testament. He said on a human level, when someone writes their will and when it's validated, um, you can't alter it. You can't change it. Now, that was true at the time of Paul's writing in that culture. By law, it couldn't be altered. It couldn't be changed. Um, And Paul's point in the first few verses was, if that's true on the human level, How much more would that be true on the divine level? In other words, if God gave a promise saying it's done this way back here, he's not going to come along 430 years later and say, well, here's a different, I'm changing my mind. Here's a different way to approach me, a different way to inherit eternal life and salvation. That was his point in those first few verses. So I left you uh, last week just really eager to come back and find out the answer this week. To the question, why then the law? Okay, if, if, if God didn't give Moses and the law, you know, the law 430 years later, uh, in order to change his way of salvation, as the Judaizers were teaching, then why, why did he give it? What was the purpose of the law? And that's what we're going to answer, what Paul's going to answer for us uh, today. Look at verses 19 and 20. Paul asked the question, why then the law? And he says it was added because of transgressions. 
having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed should come to whom the promise had been made. Now, a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Okay, you can almost hear the Judaizers saying at this point, okay, Paul, you're starting to push the limits here. Um, if it's through faith alone, you're saying that we're saved, that people are saved, that people become beneficiaries of the promise God made to Abraham, then what was the point of the law? You know, you can hear them saying, Paul, your theology basically so fuses Christ and uh, our, our Abraham and Christ together that you sort of squeeze out Moses and the law altogether. See, that's what they would say, that Paul, your theology, there's no room for the law and Moses uh, and the covenant at Mount Sinai. And they would say that's blasphemous. So that's what Paul's anticipating in our passage. Um, and he's going to answer those accusations. He says, notice what he says in verse 19. The law was added, why? Because of transgressions, he says. Okay, transgressions translates the word parabasis, which simply means stepping over the boundary. Stepping over the boundary. In other words, the purpose of the law was to show man his sinfulness. To show man how he steps over God's boundaries, his sinfulness. It's like looking in a mirror, Paul says. You look in a mirror and your own sinfulness is reflected back to you. Or as we look at God's law, our sinfulness is reflected back to us. like looking in that mirror and seeing what's wrong, so to speak. It shows us our inability to please God in our own efforts. It shows us our need for mercy, our need for grace. The law was added in the scheme of biblical history in order to show us the depth of our sin and the comprehensiveness of it and the fact that we cannot please God in our own effort to make us desperate, right? To bring us to a place where we're aware of that we're conscientious of our need for a Savior. You remember back in chapter 1 of this book when we first started the study, the opening verses there, Paul says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse 4, Who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us. You know, the gospel is first and foremost, it's a message of rescue. And until a person sees a need to be rescued, you know, people have different responses to the gospel, different responses to Christ. But if they don't feel desperate, if they don't feel a need of rescue, they're not going to come to them in a saving way. That's what the law was designed to do, to show us how desperate we are and our need and, and uh, so that we would come to Christ. Now, the law also shows us exactly how we sin up against God. It puts bones to it, so to speak. Uh, man knew he was a sinner before the law. But when the law came, now he knows exactly how he sins against God. The Bible, you know, the, the law says, you shall not steal. You shall not covet. Uh, you know, you shall not do all these things. So it was given to show us exactly how we sin against God as well as the depth of our sin. Look down at verse 24 back in chapter 3. 324, Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. See, there's the purpose of the law. It was never given to save us. It was given to show us how we fail in order that we would turn to Jesus Christ and be saved. Alan Scholes, in an article he wrote, put it, I think, very clearly when he said this. When I get up in the morning, 
the mirror shows me what's wrong. My hair's a mess. There's stubble on my face. However, I don't take the mirror down from the wall and try to use its edge to shave my beard. Likewise, God's law itself has no power to make me righteous. It merely shows me what is wrong. So I may depend on the grace of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit to change me. I think that's well put. God's law was never intended to be a means where we could be saved. Okay, that's what the Judaizers uh, taught. No, the purpose of the law was to show us, like a mirror, what's wrong. To make us hopeless and like a tutor, then to lead us to Jesus Christ where we can find salvation. Andrew Jukes said it like this, Satan would have us to prove ourselves holy by the law, which God gave to prove us sinners. You know, we still struggle with that, even as Christians, though, don't we, today, as recovering Pharisees. One of the reasons that we're drawn to the law, not for the right reasons or for the right use of the law, but we love to be able to compare ourselves with ourselves. And so everybody wants to have two or three little things from the law and be able to point to those and say, well, I'm, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing that, I'm keeping A, B, and C. We all have our short list. And then we tend to justify ourselves or feel good about ourselves. So we can still be tempted to misuse the law even as believers. An old preacher once said this, we can't really appreciate grace until we've spent some time in law school. That's true, right? You know, it made me think of the words of Jesus, the one who's forgiven much, what? Loves much. You know, until I felt the, some of the weight and the depth of where I've been or my sin, grace means a lot more. And it comes out in how we interact with other people, how we treat other people. Now, the rest of verses 19 and 20 are a bit difficult, but let me see if I can take a stab at it. Um, Paul is showing us the inferiority of the law to the gospel as a means of salvation. Okay? He says, The law was ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Now, a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Paul is comparing the way that the law was given with the way the promise to Abraham was given in order to show us the inferiority of the law. The law came through angels, he says, by the agency of a mediator, which is obviously a reference to Moses. The law came from God through angels to Moses and finally to the people. But when God spoke the gospel... When God gave Abraham the promise, he did it direct. And that's probably the meaning of the phrase, God is one, in verse 20. You know, I think we can sum up Paul's point here with the words of Bishop Stephen Neal, and he said this, The promise came to Abraham firsthand from God. The law comes to the people thirdhand. God, the angels, Moses, the mediator, the people. And so Paul's purpose in these verses is to show the superiority of the law or of, of the promise over the law. So Paul answers the question, why did God give the law? Okay, it wasn't to change his plan of salvation as the Judaizers were teaching. Uh, it was given to expose man's sin to him to show his need of a Savior. It wasn't given to replace the covenant that he had made earlier with Abraham, as the Judaizers were teaching. Now, in verses 21 to 22, Paul revisits the question that we looked at last week. The question here is, is the law then against the promise that God made to Abraham? You see, the position of the Judaizers was basically, if you keep the law, you'll get to heaven, 
right? It's work salvation, and it's we, we see it in our culture today as well, different forms of it and so forth. Um, that's, why, that's what they were telling the Galatians they had to do. But notice what Paul says in verse 21. If a law had been given which could impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But the point is, no such law was given. It was never given. Paul says the fact is, nobody has ever kept the law perfectly, consistently, except for Jesus Christ. Nobody else has done that. Instead, we break it every day, right? So the law cannot justify us. It can't save us. So how do we create harmony? How do we create harmony between God's promise to Abraham that salvation would come through faith by believing and is giving the law to Moses 430 years later? We do it this way. By seeing that men inherit the promise of eternal life by first looking at the law and seeing that they can't keep it, seeing that they are sinners. That's step one. Um, and again, that's why probably most of the people that we interact with um, don't just come running to Christ the first time you share the, your faith with them. You share the gospel with them, right? They're not at that place. They're, not, they're comfortable with their lives. They don't see themselves as undone or needy or whatever. But it says, I look at the law as I come to see that I can't live up to it, right? Like looking in that mirror and seeing the mess. Then the promise of salvation by faith becomes more desirable. Look at verse 22. But the scripture has shut up all men under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. See, as I look at God's law, another way of saying that is as I look at Scripture, as I read the Bible, it's like it holds us in prison because of our sinfulness. It's like looking in a mirror that reflects back to us what we're really like. See, and we're in a form of bondage because no matter how hard we try, we cannot live up to God's standard consistently. We're talking about that in our little men's time in the book that we're going through now. We can't live up to God's holy standard consistently. The scripture, Paul says in verse 22, shuts up all men under sin. And it's the result of being in that predicament. Not just being in that predicament. Everybody's in that predicament. But being cognizant of it. That's the difference, right? Being aware of it. Uh, that then you hope someone begins to reevaluate. Reevaluate their approach to God. Reevaluate uh, their approach to heaven. We realize we have no righteousness of our own because we've just looked at God's law. We've seen that we're big sinners. We realize we're under bondage, that the Scripture shuts us up by proving that we're sinners and guilty before God. So what do we do? Well, we look for an, an alternative. We begin to look for another way. We realize that God made a promise to Abraham years ago that through his seed, right, singular, all the families of the earth would be blessed. The blessing of God, salvation, eternal life, forgiveness of our sins comes through the seed, singular, Jesus Christ, not through keeping the law. It's received by faith. It's given to all those who believe. Luther said it like this, the principal point of the law is not to make men better, but worse. That is to say, it shows them their sin, that by the knowledge of it, they may be humbled, terrified, bruised and broken, and by this means may be driven to seek grace 
and so come to that blessed seed. Amen? Have you come to that seed this morning? Let's pray together. <clears throat> As our hearts are bowed, have you been humbled? Have you been terrified? Have you been bruised? Have you been broken over your sin? And if you have, the great word today is that God loves you. He's accomplished His purpose in your life. And through the seed, through Christ, coming to Him, the one who came to earth, the one who lived a perfect life in your place, offers you the forgiveness of your sins. He offers you the gift of eternal life. You can come to Him. You can start that journey right now simply by praying these words. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I have not kept Your Word, Your standard, Your law. But thank You that You love me. Thank You that You died on the cross for me. Come into my heart right now. Give me the gift of eternal life. And from this moment on, make me the kind of person that you want me to be. Amen.